Hello and welcome to Classics Confidential. My name is Anastasia and today I'm talking to Professor Gail Holst Woolhaft from Cornell. And we're talking about her book of poetry, Penelope's Confession. So Gail, what attracted you to Penelope? Well, I do live in Ithaca. It was a bit irresistible when you live in Ithaca to think of yourself as Penelope. And, um, you know, in a way I've always felt a little in exile from Greece um, and from all my interest in modern Greece, particularly uh, living in America. But living in Ithaca is a sort of, um, you know, you, have, you can't resist this connection to um, the Odyssey. The other thing is that um, I wrote these poems at the beginning of the Iraq war and uh, I felt very strongly that we were doing something unwise by going to this war and it struck me that there were amazing parallels between mm. uh, America going into Iraq and the Greeks going into Troy. In both cases an excuse is invented for war, you know. Uh, I think the ultimate motive was greed on both sides. I think um, Priam's city of gold was really the prize rather than Helen. And, you know, the, the threat of nuclear weapons that wasn't there was the pretext for the invasion of Iraq. So I began to think about, well, what do women think about men going off to war? What do the mothers and wives and the Penelopes who wait think about, you know, this business of going to war? So it's very much the female perspective, which I think has become a, a, a bit of a trend. Um, yes. I'm thinking in particular of Margaret Atwood's Penelope. Yes. Mm -hmm. To sort of put forward Penelope's voice yes. more uh, rather than Odysseus. I think it's inevitable in this sort of post-feminist, uh, or is it post-feminist, or are we in a fem? I, I don't know what, where we are, but you know, <laughs> certainly it's it's a trend. And um, I um, don't think of myself as a feminist, and yet I've always thought about fem female perspectives and done things in male worlds, like written about Rebetica or played in all male bands and and I've always um, I've always felt not the least bit uncomfortable in male company but thought about what it's like to be mm. a woman in this company yeah. uh, and I mean in your poems you very much um, see um, you know this waiting for a husband yes. um, and then sort of introduce the idea that maybe Penelope was sick of this label of the faithful wife yes yes I mean it is 20 years. This is a lifetime, especially, Indeed. you know, with life expectancy of her period, to think about waiting 20 years for a husband. I mean, as I say in one of the poems, you know, what woman worth her, her husband's salt is going to wait this long? I mean, this is the sort of... Um, the idea that she's faithful is um, a sort of cliché, mm -hmm. but it's maybe um, not of all that much interest. It's yeah. the, the idea is that I think she's always contrasted with Clytemnestra, who's the yeah. bad wife, who, yes. you know... He kills the husband yes. when he comes back. Yes. Um, I mean, it's interesting that other um, female, ancient female heroines mm -hmm. um, kind of come into these poems. Yes. Uh, Helen, you know, yes. another unfaithful wife. And, yes, and um, Andromache, Andromache mm. whose, whose son is killed so barbarously by the man that then she's assigned to as a prisoner of war. I mean, I thought about her as, in many ways, the most tragic figure of all. And um, uh, I've always thought about how interesting it is that the end of the Iliad is devoted to three long laments by women for someone killed in a war. And um, why would Homer end this or mm. whoever invents the whole <laughs> epic, uh, end this huge poem about the Greeks going to war with three long laments for the hero on the other mm. side. Mm. Tremendously um, untraditional yes. dealing with war, I think. Yes, and I mean, it's um, the Iliad has actually uh, been used to, um, so often to discuss, you know, contemporary wars, yes. Yes. hasn't it? So it's... Um, uh, and it's interesting to bring in more the female perspective of the non-combatants waiting. Yes, yes. And um, it's what's so fascinating to me about the whole ancient Greek literary tradition is the importance of women mm -hmm. in a society that, on face value, uh, women were expected to 
keep silent mm -hmm. and, and not be seen and stay at home. And there they are in tragedy mm -hmm. as these amazingly strong figures. So this huge, con and, and yet the plays are written mm -hmm. by men, acted by men, and you see that um, it wasn't nearly such a clear picture mm. as we think. Yes, it's much more complicated, as yes, they say. Yes, yes. Um, as well as ancient Greece, um, uh, modern Greece is also present in your uh, poems. I, mm. I, was that deliberate? Oh, yes. Um, I'm, I'm somebody who's steeped in modern Greek <laughs> tradition rather than ancient. I feel my scholarship on antiquity is um, much less extensive and much less expert than my my sort of forays into modern Greek poetry and music and uh, which have occupied half my life and um, so yes I brought the modern Greek mm. context into it and I do think that um, there is a blurring in the modern Greek sensibility between antiquity and the present. Very much so. And I think they see themselves, I mean they have Greek, ancient Greek names, they see themselves as uh, connected in a way that um, I don't think we quite often realize to a long tradition and it, it, it's got nothing to do with I think a direct line mm. of descent who knows what line of descent oh, intervenes <laughs> but, but there is um, language and yes. language plays a big role and there is this landscape mm -hmm. and uh, and there's uh, if you like um, this construction of cultural yes. memory yes yes however constructed it works for yes people. indeed it, works it does yes. um, and was that the reason why you decided to have a bilingual edition of the poems uh, both in English and in modern Greek well originally I wasn't going to do this but um, a publisher that I'd worked with on my translations of uh, the poet Nikos Cavadia said to me, why don't you make this bilingual? Um, I'll pr publish it in Greece and, you know, because you've got more, you're more known in Greece than you are in America. So, you know, people will be interested in, in a Greek version. And um, I honestly didn't like to ask uh, poets like Katerina Angelaki Rook to do too much work on this. I sort of felt it was, you know, she was a busy, well-known poet, so I asked her to do some and uh, a couple of other people and then I tried translating them mm. myself, which was an interesting exercise. I don't know how successful my <laughs> translations are, but, you know, I did run them by a few poets to, mm. to see how they worked and they said, yes, they're, they're fine, they'll do fine, you know, so, um, so I wanted to make it, it accessible mm. to to Greeks who don't read. Um, and I think it also it, it sort of brings in the, the, the importance of language, uh, yes. doesn't it? And of course of translation, yes. um, which is also a key um, uh, concept when we, of course, connect ourselves with yes. uh, antiquity as well. Yes, and I've done years of translation mm -hmm. of modern Greek stuff, and I have translated Aeschylus as well, but, you know, the work of translation is something I absolutely mm. love. I must say, it's like a secret vice. You, know? <laughs> you you sit down to translate, and you have a body of work already there. You don't have to invent anything. You just work with it. You have to invent solutions, but mm. it's it's a different skill. But there is, I think, an element of creativity as well. Yes, um, absolutely, um, very strongly. Uh, I think mm. in translation, and the best. Yes translations are. They, they must stand up as, as works in their own right, I think. And um, yes, I think, I think that it was important. In the end, I thought, well, this is an odd thing to do. But also I thought, well, I don't think any other Anglophone has ever tried translating mm -hmm. their work into Greek. So I thought, well, <clears throat> I always did like doing things for the first time. So. <laughs> Excellent. That's a very good motive. <laughs> Um, and finally, using um, the the ancient voice of Penelope and the other um, ancient Greek women, you launch off um, in the last um, section of your poems into much more of a modern setting. Um, how, how do you think um, that works? Um, in a way, why did you do it? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I think one of the things I, I always see... Um, Greece in terms of you know walking down a waterfront of an island mm. or something and and um, even when I've been involved in ancient Greek theatre productions you know you're doing a play in Epidaurus mm. but then you drive into uh, Nathrion and you have a 
coffee on the waterfront and somebody's playing the bouzouki and you know it all gets interwoven mm. and um, so my vision of Greece it came from modern I had to learn mm. ancient after I'd learnt modern and I've always sort of seen the two as being inevitably part of, of what Greece is you know wonderful well thank you very much Gail for coming and for talking to us thank you Anastasia and for also for um, a wonderful organization of a panel that was so exciting today about Theodorakis. It was really something special. Thank you, Gail.